Welcome to Focal Point, a show where we invite thought leaders from business, government, and our communities to share with us their journeys of success and failure, innovation and entrepreneurship, as well as the vision for Hong Kong and the world. Hi, my name is Danny Lee. Welcome to Focal Point. Today, we're very honored to have with us Mr. Bernard Chan, who is the current chairman of Hong Kong Palace Museum as well as M Plus Museum. Uh, not only that, he's uh, also the chairman of Tycoon, uh, as well as a board member for um, the West Kowloon uh, District Authority. Uh, on top of that, I think uh, a lot of you know Bernard for his uh, long-standing service to the uh, Hong Kong uh, public. And uh, he's been in the government for over 25 years, in addition, mind you add, to, uh, to his uh, family business. So quite the renaissance man, Bernard. <laughs> Uh, and I know have, I have known Bernie for over uh, 15 years now, so uh, love to have you here with us today and thank you for sharing with us this, this great space um, that you have at the Palace Museum. Um, but I would like to start from kind of how you started your journey. Um, a lot of people know you for your public, for your work. Um, some people know that you were art major uh, in school, not you know, business or anything like that. Uh, would love to learn about how you kind of started from an art major into the business world and then subsequently into the politics world. Well, thank you, uh, Danny, for your questions. It might take two hours, but I know we don't have that time. But first of all, thank you and welcome you to Palace Museum. Uh, this is an amazing room, a VIP room, so it's a, it's a good place to, uh, we have this, uh, this conversation. Um, certainly, uh, I got myself into uh, studying art at college uh, by accident, you know, I sort of accidentally got into politics also by accident. So nothing you see <laughs> what I do today was something I ever planned for. Uh, I grew up in a family with, uh, with bankers. So my late father was a banker, my late uncle was a banker, my, my late grandfather was a banker. So from very young, somehow I just knew that I want to be a banker, right? To, not that uh, I actually understand what banking is about, just like, but I thought, wow, it's pretty cool. I should be, I should be studying banking. Mm -hmm. And besides, I mean, financial services is a promising uh, industry, right? So, you know, you, you feel your status is very high. So I don't know whether I actually like banking or just to feel that maybe this is the right thing to do <laughs> at the time. But then I got very ill in college. Uh, in, in fact, almost like shortly after I entered as a freshman, I was diagnosed with a rare, uh, rare disease. And then I subsequently spent you know, every other semester uh, in universities. Well, I either spent one quarter, one, one semester in university, and then the other semesters in hospital, uh, recovering, uh, recuperating for my surgeries. Because I have uh, uh, two sets of uh, double pad bypasses. Not to my heart, but to my two kidneys and also one another bypass to my brain. So, so and because of that reason, because I, I had to spend so much time off campus. Now today it's easy, you know, you know we can do off campus easily by Zoom. Back then, no, I mean, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I, I recuperated either in the US or back in Hong Kong and also to Thailand as well. Okay. So during all those time that I was supposed to be resting, I thought, well, I thought that at the time that I can still make it to a graduate on time. So I thought, well, let's not waste time. So are there other classes or courses I can take that allow me uh, to get credit while you know, living off campus? And, and one reason lead to the next, I thought, well, there's a, there's a thing called independent study under the art program. I thought, oh, that's easy. I mean, I can do it. I mean, of course, I, I study art in Hong Kong. Uh, in high school, I mean, not that I'm good at it, but it's, it's not something that I thought that I can't do, right? So I thought, okay, let's do it. But never ever did I thought that I would end up major in art. I thought it was just a thing just to get a credit. But as my health continued to uh, sort of deteriorate, you know, I, so I keep spending the time, you know, in surgery and mm -hmm. then recuperation, so I end up accumulating more and more art credit. So finally, in so-called my fourth year, now obviously I didn't graduate my class, uh, I couldn't have, so, but by my fourth year, 
That was the first time I actually managed to spend the full year <laughs> on campus. And by then, uh, my art credit and my econ, I came in as an econ, thinking that I wanted to be an econ major. I have as many credit in my econ as if I have in my art. Now, if I were to be a perfectly normal person, I think my parents would kill me if I tell them I'm going to study art. But by then, because you know, I have so many surgeries, so basically my parents said, hey, you know, whatever yeah. please you. Yeah. Right? So they let me, they let me choose. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I knew that I, I would end up be a banker, because right? that's still my dream. <laughs> right? I still, that's still my dream. But I thought, well, actually, I kind of like art. I mean, now that I have studied you know, over the last couple of years, I thought, oh, this is something interesting and fun. And honestly, to be very honest, it's easier too right. at that time, right? right? Um, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan of uh, statistics, <laughs> and these or macro, DCFs. yes, exactly. So I thought, hmm. But I knew that I was always gonna go back to financial services. So I thought, well, I think it's quite okay. I kind of like it, I enjoy yeah. it. And that's what I did. Now, but, but never have I ever imagined that art degree, that so-called art degree, I, I'm actually, to be exact, I'm a studio art yeah. major will get me anywhere, right? Um, because I knew that not going to help me in whatever future career I have at that time, yeah. I thought. Yeah. So even after I graduated from college, I was just too, uh, too ashamed to even admit that I'm a, you know, an art major because I think back home in Hong Kong, uh, no one would appreciate and understand why. In fact, every time I felt that if I have to explain, I feel like I have to explain, oh, I have to start this whole history of I was sick and right. da 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 da. To justify why. To you justify work for that. why yeah. I study art. That's how I felt. In fact, um, you know, honestly, I was hiding this identity of mine for a good ten years. Mm. You know, because I just feel that uh, you know I won't be accepted, uh, and um, you know people will you know look down on me, and that's how I felt mm. at the time. Mm. So after all that went into the family business, I think, uh, and then into politics. Well, that is also uh, <laughs> by accident. Right. And I just told you, I always thought I'm going to be a banker. Mm -hmm. right? So after college, I, I worked in New York for a very short period of time, for two years, a little less than two years. Then I came back to work for uh, my uncle, his investment firm. And then uh, you know, my dad told me, hey, you know, um, you know we also invest in the insurance company. And my father said, hey, you know, we sh you should get to know about how insurance operates. So he wants me to go to the insurance industry. I was very reluctant in the beginning because, again, it's all about this whole thing called you know, the status, right? Because banker, you're like, wow, you know, sounds good. Right. You feel like, wow, I'm a banker. And you feel like insurance is not quite in the same league. <laughs> That's how I felt at the time. So I reluctantly, I agree, because my father said, hey, listen, you know, we, we, you know, someone from the family should go and understand this. So very reluctantly, I joined this company. But even that, I wasn't really uh, working in the insurance side of the business. I was really more looking at the investment side of the insurance company, because yeah. you know, insurance company um, uh, use the, the, f the premium also invest in to them. invest. Yeah. And so I was looking at that, right? Yep. Because I didn't think that I would actually enjoy underwriting and all this, the, the risk management part of the business. But again, you know, never would I imagine by entering the insurance completely changed the course of my life. Right. Because it was because of insurance that got me into politics. Because I think I joined insurance in 95 or 96. And two years later, you know, Hong Kong returned to China, to the motherland. And the year after that, uh, in the first Legislative Council election, for the first time, uh, there's a, a seat to represent the insurance industry. Yeah. And, and that's how I got into politics. And of course, I was never uh, meant to be. It was because, you know, I know nothing about politics like most people at the time. Worse, I actually don't understand insurance. <laughs> so uh, how on earth am I even qualified for that? Right? But, right. but it was just at the time, so happened there were already three other, um, other um, uh, persons who already have indicated their interest. 
and, and among the local companies, um, they were hoping that you know, maybe there's someone among the local company that, that would be willing. So it, they didn't actually come to me. Mm. They, they asked my boss in the company. And, uh, but you know, he says the same thing. You know, he's too old for this, and he doesn't understand politics, so, and so on and so on. So one thing leads to another. He reached out to me. Maybe he figured that, hey, this guy has nothing to do in the office. Maybe uh, you know, I should. So he encouraged me. He encouraged me to give it a, give it a try. I think initially I thought, like, you're crazy. You know, what is politics, right? Like most people at the time, politics is such a foreign thing, right? right. I think most people who grew up in Hong Kong before 97. Don't want to be involved. Have very little exposure. Yeah. I think by design, I think most people in Hong Kong have always been trained to do business only, right? right. You leave the politics to somebody else. Right. But when 97 came, that changed, right? Because Hong Kong people for the first time can decide our own future, right? Mm. So anyways, to me, it was it's just a, such a foreign thing, right? But, but then I thought, well, what did I got to lose, right? I mean, again, just like how I got into art, just like how I got into insurance, it's not exactly how I want to go into politics, but then somehow the opportunity was sort of presented to me, and I thought, well, what do I get to lose, right? So, and again, I, was, I, I ran against three other veterans in the industry. They are like 20, 30 years of my senior, and not to mention probably 30 years uh, in the industry more than me, right? So I thought, well, I got nothing to lose, and so, so I joined the race, and, and surprise, I won. <laughs> and I won by just a very tiny margin. I think I won by less than 10 votes. Uh, actually, that's more frightening after I won, because then I realized, oh my goodness, I'm, I am now a politician, <laughs> <right>? what <laughs> is this? <laughs> so, but that, that's, that's how I got into it, and it's amazing, I mean, like, uh, again, the message is, it was never my intent. Right. Well, whether I got into art or I got into politics or when I got into insurance, none of those things were so-called my first choice. Yeah. In fact, it's not even any choice of mine to start with. But it was those decisions. Some are decisions, some are, it just happened. But uh, I, I managed to uh, take advantage of whatever came your way. Came yeah. my way yeah. and I make the best out of it. That's right. And uh, that's how I end up where I am today. Uh, there's more story behind it too, how uh, I make good use of my art degree, so <laughs> to say. <laughs> right. And uh, it, okay. it's just amazing that I, I'm so fortunate to have yeah. this opportunity. Because the consistency I hear is that you basically made the best out of whatever is thrown your way. Right? Yes. Would it not be art, would it not be business, would it not be insurance? I think that's yes. something that's, uh, or, you know, uh, or politics. That's just something that I think a lot of young people should take note and learn from. A lot of things are not planned. Yes. And they're not, you know, they're all laid out for you. It just comes your way and you do the best. Exactly, Danny. I think I, mean, I always, uh, I mentor some students from time to time. And this is the lesson I always tell them. I said, listen, you know, every one of you, including me, right, every one of us, I should say, have so-called a dream job, right? Everyone yeah. has one, right? <laughs> right, right. Uh, but I suspect that no more than 10% of us will ever get what they want, right? And I say, if you are that lucky 10%, you can leave now. You don't need to talk to me anymore, right? You can go, right? Because you got what you want. Yeah. But then what happened to the other 90%, so-called 90% of the people who don't get what they want? Then what do you do, yeah. right? So then I, I further analyze that likely there will be three types of situations. Situation one is you continue to dream <laughs> and wait for that to happen, right? That's mm -hmm. scenario one. Mm -hmm. So you're lucky enough, maybe one day will happen. Scenario two, you still dream about whatever you're hoping for. But meantime, hey, we still have to make a living, yep. right? Life goes on, right? So you can't continue to wait for nothing, right? So you find whatever is available, right? But you still, your heart is still with that dream. So come, somehow you're like, okay, I'll you know, do whatever is needed to allow me just to continue to carry on my dream. That's number two. Number three, same thing. You still dream for whatever you're, you're dreaming for. You continue with whatever we can be giving you. But the difference is, while you're waiting, you make the best of what's given to you today. I believe that I fall into that category three. 
So I was still, I, at the time, no more now, but at one time, I was still hoping that one day I'll be a banker. <laughs> right? <laughs> Seriously, right. I think, no, until uh, maybe only 10 years ago, I finally <laughs> gave up. <laughs> I figured, well, actually, banking is not that good anymore. Yeah, that's right. right? But for this is all, not too bad. Right, for all my life, I was still hoping that one day yeah. I'll come back to that. But meantime, I'm not going to waste my time, right? right. I'm going to just do my best of what we're giving to me. Yeah. And it's amazingly because once that attitude change, new doors open, yeah. right? That's right. Because I think if you just anyhow do, right, and you do a you know, kind of half half that way, these new doors will never open, mm. right? Mm. Mm. But so happened in my life is just every situation, even though very unwillingly, not exactly what I want, I still try to make the best out of it. Yep. And it's it consistently proven that each time if you put enough effort, right, you put your heart into that job, something will open. Well, it may not open instantly, yeah. but you will eventually. So I think that's how it get, to me, it get me to where I am today, right? So lots of people out there think that, oh, I have it all planned out, right? My whole political journey has all been planned out and absolutely not true. I think you know me well enough. Yeah. Is I'm kind of like, I mean, in a way it's, it's, it's not good because I mean, I've gone to the extreme. It's, I don't plan anything. <laughs> <laughs> I just try to do whatever is right here at the moment and make the best of it. Mm. And I believe that w once you make the best of whatever you've been asked to do, new things will happen. But if you keep planning things too far out and all you care about is the end and not the mean, then you're never going to get good at it. You care too much about the end that you forgot that... Well, a lot of us probably don't know what the end is. True, right? yeah. true. I don't either, but yeah. I just know that... Yeah, exactly. So I think the important thing is you got to make this right yeah. first. Do whatever is given to you. Even though it might on, on, in, in the surface, it may not be very good, so it may not be very rewarding, but that's the thing, right? These things take time to see the, uh, the outcome, right? So to me, it's like, after 30 years, I finally realized, that, damn, it's my art degree that, <laughs> that got me where that's, I am today. That started everything. Right? But it, it's, a, it's a nice... Uh, you know, full circle, right? You know, the Chinese believe in this whole circle and the circular goes back and you're going all the way back from college art degree to this, yes. to the museum, right? So back to what you studied and, and what you enjoyed. Um, but let's, let's talk a little bit about Hong Kong and the art in Hong Kong, because like you said, I came here 25 years ago and art wasn't the thing that Hong Kong was known for. Mm -hmm. It was finance, it was banking. Mm -hmm. I myself was in that industry as well. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how, how do you know, how do you learn, or how do you compare and contrast to Hong Kong's art industry, let's say, relative to the rest of the world? Well, we certainly came a long way. I, I, as I said just now, you know, 30 years ago, I think I would be too ashamed right, to let anyone know that I study studio art, because immediately um, there's doubt cast on you. It's like, oh, this guy must be no good. I mean, he must be like trying to take an easy way out, right? That kind of thing. It's not so much about you. It's a society, right, as mm -hmm. a whole. Uh, they won't accept you, right? They only, they, so your career from arts and culture is uh, very limited, right? Today is a whole different generation. Yeah. I think it takes a lot, right? First, is the, the entire generation is different. Today's generation, of course, professional career is still important, right? But, but equally now, we have you know, young people who, who who say, well, I don't necessarily have to make more money. I don't even have to be, I mean, I, I can imagine nowadays, you know, the top jobs will be, apart from being a doctor, a, f a physician, then of course it's investment banking. A lawyer. Lawyers, yeah. and, you know, because these are- High paying jobs. High paying job, and of course you're going to uh, private equity, you want to go into uh, consultancy, that kind of thing. Sure, we still got those today, right? Still have, but now, we do have young people who aspire to have something else, right? You know, they want to do, in fact, just, you know, a few days ago, a friend of mine told me that, you know, the daughter wants to uh, do impact investment, right? Not just the dollar sign, they want to look for something beyond that. And I have a friend who, who has son return and wants to be, you know, installer, <laughs> you know, doing installation for artwork and things like that. So I think, the, first of all, the generation is, first, is, is, has changed. Mm -hmm. The parents' generation also changed. I, I, I'm not saying all parents, but at least increasingly I met parents who are 
allowing their children to it's more explore. accepted as a, as right? a choice, as a, a career choice. choice right? yeah. so, they, so I think that, that helps a lot. Mm. Then, of course, Hong Kong has changed, right? So now, of, you know, 30 years ago, you know, what sort of institution do we have? Today at West Kowloon, now, it took us 20 years, but finally, I mean, I think when we first came up with the idea of West Kowloon Cultural District, a lot of you know, skeptics out there were saying, well, is it going to be just another you know, property project, right? come fast with arts. But now, with the opening of C2, with the opening of Amplas, uh, Free Space, and now with Palace Museum, and soon, in a year or so later, uh, Lyric Theatre, and many more, uh, if we have the money to build, that whole ecosystem mm. is finally here. Mm. Now, of course, that's just the hardware, right? We still need the software, and software meaning, well, the people, right? Mm -hmm. But it takes, it's kind of like chicken and egg, you know? Now that you have the hardware, right. you can develop the software. It takes time to develop that whole local talents. But, but it's not just the local talents. We need to attract the best talent from the world to come. You know, you and I know we are in the financial services. Hong Kong will always remain as a, in, in one of the three major financial centers. But when you compare to the other two, New York and London, New York and London are not just known for being a financial center, Sorry. but they are also the center for arts and culture. culture. Why? Because that's how they can attract the best talent in financial service or in anything, right? So because for these types of talents, it's not just the job that they come after, but they want to know whether this city is where they want to build a family, yeah. right? It's a lifestyle choice. Lifestyle, right? Culture. Exactly, because we, because we compete, right? All these cities, great city, mm. we compete. Mm. So they need to know whether the city is safe, you know, whether good school for their children, arts and culture, and other stuff. So I think, you know, for Hong Kong to remain relevant as a financial center, it's not about the money. Mm. Now, of course, 30 years ago, it's all about money. <laughs> Today, I think finally, with the hardware and with the right software to follow, we can be uh, as equal to the London and New York, and especially for our region, right? But that software is not just about you know, the, 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 the people involved in the industry, the ecosystem. By the way, it's not just the public institution. It's the private galleries, trading. You know, now that we are, the, in fact, amazingly, we're now the second largest uh, art trading hub in the world, right? So, so there's, a, there's a public and there's a private component as well. But even beyond this, another software, so-called software we need to build, is the audience, mm. right? We need to educate the audience, know how to appreciate. Not just appreciate the art form, but also to appreciate the differences. You may not like everything you see, but you need to learn to respect others. And that is important, the audience, right? And, but the, amazingly, I think why, again, to back to your question, why now is the, the time today? Because that audience is not just our 7.4 million people. It's that growing 300, 400 million middle class in China. Because for that group of people, they also want to have access to better education for the kids, Healthcare, arts and culture. Now, of course, uh, let's not talk about that 300, 400 million right, of the whole China. Even within Greater Bay Area, I can imagine, you know, Greater Bay Area has 70 million, I don't know, maybe even out of that, 20, just 20 million. For this group of people, within one hour, right, with their high speed rail and so on, within one hour, mm. definitely, they can access to Hong Kong. You know, they can enjoy. Right, so they, we, have a, we have a market now, a demand to support this ecosystem. So 30 years ago, it, 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 doesn't, ex you know, it doesn't happen. Mm, mm. But today, you know, with everything's evolving and it's actually happening. So I'm actually very super bullish that arts and culture will stay and will become a very important you know, pillar. Okay. Nothing less than like us in the high finance as well. I do believe that with the demand and hopefully with the offerings, with the right offerings we have here, it is going to be a very prominent feature for Hong Kong 
for the region. Is the government doing anything to further help with that? Because I know the government already obviously sponsored, gave a lot of money to West Kowloon to, to build the museum. So is the government doing anything to help, let's say, smaller artists or enterprises or whatever to, you know, create innovation, like you said, almost create the content, right? Because it has to come from a broader base. Uh, anything the government or institutions are doing in Hong Kong? Well, uh, there's a lot more we need to do, and that's why I think in this new term of office, the sixth term of the SAR government, they now have a, a specific bureau being created uh, to look after arts and culture and sports and tourism under one. Okay. And I suspect that with this new bureau, uh, you know, I think more resources will put in it. Mind you, uh, for those who, uh, if you understand Chinese politics, uh, under the 14 five years plan, China 14 five years plan, under Hong Kong, arts and culture is now a key feature. We now been tasked to be that gateway connecting the East and West culture mm. you know, through Hong Kong. So I think with that mandate, this again, this is not Hong Kong government now. This is national mandate. Like, you know, central government allow or task Hong Kong mm. to be serving that purpose. So I think with that as a mandate, government, Hong Kong local government, have to deliver, right? So I suspect that resources will come. Mm -hmm. But like you said, you're right. So you know, there's two components to it. First is obviously how do we draw audience and demand from you know, international. In other words, we need to, uh, the quality uh, has to be international standard. But at the same time though, we need to groom also local talents. Right. Right? Because you can't just, you know, serve the premium. You need to also address the local needs. How do you groom local? I think that's that's why I think um, I think the government can do that. They can give uh, more funding uh, to the more the I mean, local it, local uh, different. You know, you know, there's a lot of art uh, communities in Hong Kong yeah. that the government can help. Is that part of the mandate for Hong Kong Palace Museum and M Plus as well? Uh, not exactly in that sense because the funding will not come from us. The government uh, the coming will come from the government. What the government can do, though, however, is to how to work with the business sector. Mm. Yeah, how do, how the you know business sector can come to the picture. Now, of course, what Palace or M Plus can do is we also work with the you know, the private sectors because uh, the funding from government is not alone uh, is enough, mm. right? You know. Um, if you look at pallets, uh, right now at the moment, uh, ticket sales is only about 30% of our income. So about 40% is still come from West Kowloon Cultural District, right? Okay. And of course the district itself is also having some issues because we, you know, we haven't got our funding source yet. I mean, ideally is once the whole district is developed, there will be f uh, income coming from uh, residential uh, uh, incomes as well as uh, commercial income, rental incomes. Right. But none of them is here yet. Mm. So I mean, so so the budget for West Kowloon Cultural District is also very tight at the moment, and that's why we also need to go and find funding sources as well. In addition to the government, the government already gave us one uh, big in endowment uh, to start the district, okay. but that money is you know pretty much used up. So we need to go and find fund other funding sources. Just like for Palace Museum, the entire construction of, of Palace Museum uh, came from a donation from, uh, from Jockey Club. So they gave us 3.5 billion Hong Kong dollars to build Palace Museum. Uh, so, so, so the same will probably go with other, other um, like say the music theater, the Broadway theater, all these other new theater, uh, new facilities that, uh, uh, that has not been built yet. We will need to f tap other, finding, uh, other funding sources. So if we can find a philanthropist that's willing to support us, that would be great. Mm. So I think, because the government already gave us a lot of money, right? And, and not just the money part, they also give us the, the right to use the land to develop commercial and right. residential, da, da, da. Right, right. So uh, it's a huge commitment. Um, but again, as I said, uh, to keep Hong Kong relevant as a important financial center, uh, or even as an international city, Arts and culture is a huge component of it. Yep. But it, so it sounds like it, the government is both doing this top down and also bottom up, right? Top down in the sense that the government's al al allocated a lot of funding, you know, designed all these projects, but bottom up, as you said, that allowing West Kowloon and uh, M Plus and, and Pal Palace to kind of leverage, leverage off the, or connect with the business That's right. community to try to 
get the funding from the local right. level as well, not just from the top. Enjoyed it? Please follow our Patreon channel to learn more about international business, all treasured knowledge, latest innovation, and scholars' insights, and even more. See you soon.